James Egbert. I got started making electronic music just out of kind of necessity, actually. I was in a metal band in high school and we showed up to our practice space one day and everything was stolen. And my way of continuing my love for music and my love for creating music was uh, with this new laptop that I had just received as a graduation present for high school. My family knew that I wanted to get into it was really audio engineering at the time because I didn't really think that being an artist was something feasible. It seemed like kind of a long shot. And so I, I was planning on going to school for audio engineering so that I could get a job, hopefully, in a studio somewhere. And so um, I started learning GarageBand. Um, one of the bands that we played with in that kind of time period, they were incorporating electronics. And so I was like, oh, I could kind of see how maybe I could do something that I liked with electronic music. And this was right after the Postal Service came out with their uh, album that was just kind of infamous. And uh, that really kind of hooked me because it was like, wow, this is entirely electronic. Like that's something that I could do maybe. Kind of after tinkering around for a bit, um, the genre that I fell into was drum and bass as that was kind of reflective of the heavy metal stuff that I was into in the past and kind of held that same sort of energy and um, kind of upbeat vibe. And so I was just tinkering with it for a long time, still really in love with songwriting as well. And so I started making kind of this uh, electronic music that was, um, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was, it was kind of drum and bass oriented, but also very pop oriented and so I just started putting that up on MySpace um, back in that era and uh, one thing kind of led to another and I found myself producing for other artists that I had once respected and uh, that was really kind of where everything took off for me and became uh, professional. I was 18 years old whenever I was approached by my first um, manager and approached by um, my first kind of record deal per se it was a production deal so uh, another producer had taken interest in the project and wanted to co-produce it with me with the hopes of it getting kind of out to a record label and all this sort of extra stuff and i was working at sports authority at a store just in a warehouse in the back and um, that was that was when i was still just producing my own stuff and so i did a tour for that project and kind of started to pick up some momentum, but I still had to work 40 hours a week, which was kind of tough, but it also, those 40 hours a week really made me want to work on the music all that much more, which I think was a very special thing that um, I may have lost now that it's full-time music all the time. Um, but I just kept doing that and kept doing that. And as I had mentioned, I was, I started to produce for other people. And so, it started being this thing of, well, switch to part-time. And so now music was occupying half of my time and then Sports Authority was still kind of holding down uh, financially for me. Just as I started to realize that I was having more opportunities, I got an offer to do a, a pretty big album for me at the time. And um, it was in that moment when I decided okay, I, it's gonna be a long stretch, but I think I can make that jump now. So I quit my job and I moved in with my brother for free rent. I think that uh, that, that was one of the biggest deals is just having, having that sort of stability um, in, in case it didn't really work out that month, but it was a definite leap. And I, I think I was t barely 21 whenever that finally happened and it was professional at that point. The album was, uh, was for another Denver-based artist by the name of Kill Paradise. And they were kind of electronic pop, but at the top of all the MySpace electronic charts. And not a lot of people know this, uh, Denver electronic music has been really a big deal for a long time, just uh, especially out of that MySpace era of music. So in this process of producing for other artists, I got an opportunity to produce for a uh, very well established DJ and it was kind of in that time when um, I was hanging out with the guy and this guy's just a legend and he was saying like well surely you have to kind of be working on your own stuff right I was like well kind of but I haven't really 
put anything out necessarily. Like, hadn't really tried to release anything on my own name yet. And so I showed it to him. He was like, you have to put this out. But it wasn't anything that really made anything pop for me. Um, it was actually a couple months later that I wrote an EP called Blackhawk. And um, it got picked up by a really pretty uh, hustling, bustling, growing blog at the time. This song is sick. And uh, they were really the first people to strongly support me as my own artist rather than producing for other people. And it was out of their support that um, I started getting shows booked. And it wasn't really an intention of mine necessarily to begin DJing or anything like that. It's just, that was the type of music that I was making. And I've always tried to incorporate a live sort of energy because I've loved that even from the early band days of being a drummer, just being behind the rest of the band and seeing all my other friends' energy. Um, it was something that I always just drew off of. And so having that live experience, that live interaction again, that was, that was DJing for this genre. And yeah, that was, that was pretty cool because the first gig that I actually got booked on had me play at Red Rocks. So it was just a, a crazy whirlwind um, just to release this very kind of, it, it was still super bedroom oriented for me at the time, just trying to put out some music that I, I liked and uh, got picked up by a huge blog and then put me on a huge show and started touring around the US and then internationally very soon after that. Kind of in the process, I'd already started to get my name out there a little bit, um, but I found out, I think it was 2012, that EDC was um, opening this new sort of contest called the Discovery Project. And it was this opportunity for um, basically um, relatively undiscovered artists to get a chance to play on EDC without having to go through the standard booking process. All you had to do was um, create a little mini mix that was about 30 minutes long, I think, was their uh, request. And so I decided, well, since I've kind of started my whole career more as a producer, I'm just gonna put only my songs in there. So yeah, I made this mini mix exclusively on my own songs and later I would kind of decide that that was a pretty big important thing for me to only mix my own music. But I ended up getting to like play this primetime like midnight slot at EDC um, in Vegas and that was just like crazy because that was another huge stepping stone to just get my name out to so many more people than I would have been able to otherwise. So EDC was a, it was a pretty funny experience just because as I said it was like a midnight sort of time slot so I'm playing against I'm pretty sure like Cascade uh, and I think also Fetty Legrand on another stage. So I knew having a midnight slot was like a blessing and a curse at the same time because I would really only have like my biggest diehard fans out. So it was kind of funny, like the way that they have had that stage set up that year was in the middle of this like courtyard where, um, where it was like kind of a concession area. And so it was kind of just transient people walking in and out the whole time. And whenever I got on for my set, there was like maybe 150 people there that were, uh, I think there to see me. But uh, so I was like, man, it's kind of not good. But as I looked up from the decks, like maybe 15 minutes in, it's like, it's getting packed out. There were probably 1,500 or 2,000 people there. And it, it just ended up being like a really good event and uh, started to get like a lot of following from that. Right around that EDC time, I put out another EP of just original content and um, had a good friend at the time remix that. and. Uh, it was his first production that he ever released, but his name was Blau. And now he's got a pretty big name for himself. And so it was kind of, kind of a cool experience, but, but just through that, um, I think even maybe having him remix, it kind of got some further insight to, uh, to me and my name and my label and that album and stuff. And so that album was Beatport number one. And out of a result of that, I think, 
um, started getting some attention from major labels for remixes and stuff like that. So I had um, like Capitol Records hit me up for Emily Sandé, and then after that remix was highly successful, I think that package was number one on Billboard. After that, they hit me back with this, this small time vocalist from the UK by the name of Sam Smith and was like, this guy is talented, you know. Uh, one thing that they complimented me on was how picky I am with, with vocalists. So they, they were like, well, you're gonna like this guy. And sure enough, that song was La La La, produced by Naughty Boy. And it was just massive over there, but it hadn't really got here yet. And so uh, that was just really unique, um, amazing opportunity to have the chance to remix such a talented guy that early into his career. One of the big kind of things that I started to realize as all of this was progressing was that my fan base was really growing full of people who really strongly appreciated the production process and the writing process. And it was out of that realization that I decided that uh, I kind of had a heart for education as well. That was when I decided to start a Twitch live stream and so it was just a, the sort of deal like, you know, I could kind of help my fans out and kind of give back to my fans uh, in a meaningful way um, just because they really appreciated the, the technicality of my music. This gave me an opportunity to, to kind of share some of that with them and uh, interact and become closer with my fans. And I think that generally that's a, that's a pretty good thing for um, a producer to do because you have to have a certain level of confidence in yourself that's kind of unshakable in order to give away like your deepest secrets. Um, just kind of have to have a confidence that like, well, it's still like a bit in the brain of how I do it. And um, that's what's going to keep myself unique even after I share whatever secrets. And I think that that kind of has helped me even continue to grow as a producer as well. One day it was, just doing my regular Twitch feed, and um, afterwards I got an email from the guys at Fader Pro. They were, took an interest to what I was doing kind of educationally on the live stream and asked me if I would teach a class at Fader Pro. So now here we are. Yeah.